The way people think I make videos is that I wake up in the morning, look up some cool science news, talk about it for five minutes, done. The way it actually works is that I sort through a thousand crappy press releases and then despair over something like quantum mechanics experiment measures a pulse of light in 37 dimensions. I've no idea what that means. But after thinking about it for a week and several existential crises, I believe I've figured it out. So here's my five minute summary. The authors of this new paper have found a theoretical and experimental proof that quantum mechanics is weirder than we thought, not just verbally, but in a quantifiable way that could be used on quantum computers. It's actually pretty cool and it gives me an opportunity to explain how superdeterminism works. In the new paper, they study a variant of a problem known as the GHZ paradox. It's nothing to do with gigahertz, but stands for Greenberger Horn Zeilinger. For this, you need three quantum particles that have at least two different properties. Properties. Typically, one uses electrons and measures their spin in two different directions, say horizontally and vertically. An electron is really just a tiny spinning ball, except it's not a ball and it's not spinning, which is hard to draw. So I hope you'll excuse that I'll use coins for illustration instead. These coins have two properties that correspond to the electron spin in two different directions. Let's say they're either red or blue, and they have plus one on one side and minus one on the other. We'll measure either their color or what side is up. In analogy with the electron spins, we say that if the coin's red, we'll count this as a plus one, and if it's blue, we'll count this as a minus one. If the coin lands on an edge, we'll just pretend it didn't happen. For this quantum paradox, one needs three of these coins. We throw them on the table and then we make measurements on them. A possible sequence of measurements is that we measure the color of the first coin and the sides of the two other coins. For each of these measurements, we get a result that's either plus one or minus one, and then we multiply them. Here is an example for the first set of measurements. Let's say the result is plus one. We then make two further measurements in different combinations and let's say the result is also plus one. This doesn't have to be the case but it's a possible outcome and it just makes things easier to look at this particular example. You can see that in this sequence all the side measurements appear twice. This means that if we multiply all the measurement results, the side measurements will square to one, regardless of whether the plus one or minus sides were up. So from the previous three results, we always know that multiplying all three color results will also give one. And we can also see this in our table. The problem is that if you actually make this experiment with electrons and their spin, the result is minus one. This is the paradox. There's no combination of coin results that can give you the result we actually observe. So what's going on? The problem with our calculation is that we assume that the coins have values that are either plus or minus one, and that these values don't change if we make further measurements. Take, for example, the second coin. What we measured here is first which side is up, then the color, and then again which side is up. This means we assumed that the side doesn't change if we measure the color. But electrons are quantum particles, and for quantum particles, measuring one thing like the color can change something you already measured previously, like the side. Or to go back to the electron, measuring the spin in one direction makes the spin in the other direction maximally uncertain. Therefore, if you use quantum mechanics to calculate the result of the fourth measurement, you get the correct answer that agrees with observations. Loosely speaking, this is because if you multiply these measurement results in quantum mechanics and want to remove the ones that square to one, you need to change their order. 
And if you do that in quantum mechanics, this can bring in a minus. But the most interesting thing about this paradox is that the final result, the minus one, is not probabilistic. It's deterministic. It follows from the previous ones. Once you have the results of the first three measurements, you know the result of the fourth. And this has practical use. It means that if you can generate three electrons and make those measurements, that'll all and reliably produce this weird quantum state. And it's this quantum weirdness that gives quantum computers their extra edge. This is why physicists are so keen on finding reliable ways to generate it, because it means additional computational power. And this finally brings me to the paper with the 37 dimensions. The authors first provide mathematical proof that to find this reliable quantum weirdness, one doesn't need four measurements to find a contradiction, as we did. They say one could do it with merely three. And then they experimentally construct a way to do this. This is where the 37 dimensions come in. These are not dimensions of space, like space around us. The 37 dimensions are the dimensions of the Hilbert space for six photons. This means basically that taken together, the photons have 37 different measurable properties, polarization, phases, intensity, and so on. So it's not as mysterious as it sounds. Sorry. But isn't this always the case with quantum physics, that if you look at the maths, it's not as mysterious as it sounds? Why 37? That's just the lowest number of dimensions that they found to work. Maybe tomorrow someone will do it in 19. And no, I'm not going to draw your table in 37 dimensions. I have my limits. Let me instead add some comments on what this is all good for. The advantage of quantum computers comes from them having properties that a non-quantum system can't have. And these paradoxical GHZ states are a great example for this, because if you know how to generate them, they're so reliable. And the fewer measurements you need to make, the more efficient your calculation becomes. And three is less than four. On the flip side, you now have to deal with these 37 dimensions, so don't expect this to go into mass production tomorrow. On a more practical note, if you're working on your own theory of quantum physics, and I know there are quite a few among you who dream of that, you need to come up with a way to obtain the correct results for the GHZ experiment. And then let me finally say some words about how superdeterminism explains the quantum mechanical result. Superdeterminism is an unfortunate term that John Bell used to describe what he thought was an implausible explanation. What it really means is just that the probability of a measurement outcome depends on what you measure. In the GHZ table, this means that, for example, the result for the side of the second coin in the third measurement can differ from the one in the first measurement because the measurements on the other coins are different. The result depends on the context. The benefit of superdeterminism and the reason why I'm convinced it's the correct explanation is that it's local and therefore compatible with Einstein's theory. Superdeterminism has no spooky action at a distance. Indeed, we know from Bell's theorem that it's the only way to make sure the results of quantum mechanics are compatible with Einstein's locality. Many people don't like this explanation because they think it's constraining their free will or something. But the way that I think about it is that it's just a consistency requirement. And yes, I'm working on a few more papers about this. It's just that these videos keep getting in the way. But hey, at least we learned something. At the very least, how to give Sabina an existential crisis. Did you know there's a free and easy way to learn more about the science behind all the videos that you've been watching? Yes, there is. Have a look at Brilliant. Brilliant offers courses on a large variety of topics in science, computer science and mathematics. All their courses have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. Whether you want to know more about large language models or algebra, want to learn coding in Python or know how computer memory works, Brilliant has you covered. It's a fast and easy way to learn and you can do it whenever and wherever you have the time. And they're adding new courses each month. 
I even have my own course on Brilliant. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. It'll help you understand what a wave function is and what the difference is between superpositions and entanglement. It also covers interference, the uncertainty principle and Bell's theorem. And after that, you can continue maybe with a course on quantum computing or differential equations. And of course, I have a special offer for viewers of this channel. If you use my link brilliant.org slash Sabine or scan the QR code, you'll get to try out everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days. And you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and check this out. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.